Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for for just allowing us the privilege to, to continue to feast upon your word together, to fellowship together uh, over your word, to think about it, to meditate on it, and to share that word, that precious word with others. Well, I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, all of that which is of self, all of that which is untrue, just filter out the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're still here. We've been studying together the epistle uh, to the Philippians, verse by verse, and in our last uh, study together, we looked at the passage in the area of verse 20 through 23. So that's kind of where we're at while we're waiting for the Lord's return, which could be uh, uh, could be any time. Um, I look at I look at June and July as high watch months, uh, if not this year, then next year. But we're going to keep looking up. We're studying together an epistle that is quite amazing in the sense that that it is probably at least and this is my and I, I may be prejudiced in my opinion but this epistle really is one in in which paul really does focus on the person and work of jesus christ not that other epistles don't but christ our life we're going to talk about christ our life uh, which is a little different than what modern christianity tends to uh, how they how they view how modern Christianity today views that phrase Christ our life. Uh, I think that that if we really are serious about understanding the the good news of Jesus Christ and the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we daily grow into, and uh, it, when it comes to the matters of sanctification and walk and our walk our conduct our behavior our spiritual growth. Uh, there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And I believe that uh, uh, it, it can pretty much be uh, minimized or s uh, summed up into a discussion concerning law and grace. It's either going to be law or it's going to be grace. And uh, what I find so exciting about this particular epistle in general and this area in which we're in that we're studying in particular is is the is how Paul the apostle describes our relationship to Christ as one in which it's really not us the Christian that lives the Christian life but it's Christ himself now the, the, f folks l listen dearly beloved this is not we're not talking about semantics here we're not talking about a uh, poetry we're not talking about uh, anything other than the, the the genuine fact that authentic christianity is governed by a principle and that is grace not law and it is not us that live for christ but it is christ living his life through us it's a it's a complete reversal of what modern christianity would normal would consider the norm you know, which is basically it's, well, even though we are Christians in an age of grace, the church, uh, we're not under law, uh, and so on and so forth, we still are subject to the law of Christ, which is really not much different than the law of Moses. It's just the, the person's changed. It's not Moses, it's Christ that we're subject to, and it's law. And we, and we look at Scripture, and we read it, and, and we just do it, and that's law. And if we do that, and we do a success, a fine job of that, then the Lord is pleased with us. And if we don't, He's not. I hope that by the time we get to the end of this video, you'll see that there's quite a, a stark difference between modern Christianity's use usage of the term uh, uh, "Christ our life" and Paul's the true meaning that the Holy Spirit intended to convey through Paul concerning that phrase, Christ our life. Let's just look at Paul for a moment. Uh, 
we know that he excelled among all, all of the Jews. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The, the Holy Spirit has him testify that, that he was way, way ahead of the rest of his countrymen because of his zeal, his enthusiasm for God. None of us have ever studied the Old Testament scriptures like Paul did. Uh, Paul worshipped the God of the scriptures as he saw him. Jehovah God, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And as far as Paul knew, he was serving God with every bit of his strength, his power, his mental abil ability, his, 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 his dedication. Everything that was in Paul, as far as Paul was concerned, he was doing everything right. Okay, But what he didn't see was that the very God that he worshipped was the one who had provided the sacrifice for sin. And as a result, uh, no longer do we live by law, but by grace. And once Paul had seen that, I want you to imagine how that the Old Testament must have opened up for him. Instead of, uh, uh, instead of just seeing Jehovah, he now sees Christ in the Passover. He sees Christ in creation. And yet we're clearly told that immediately after Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, God drove him into the wilderness where he received a special revelation of Jesus Christ. He says that this revelation was made to him. It was actually made to the other apostles as well. So they also, I believe, they also received a special revelation from God. But it's quite clear that, that it, a marvelous student of the Old Covenant needed that revelation just as we need the revelation in the New Covenant. I mean, suppose we didn't have the New Testament. Suppose we didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and I, I ran out of breath. Imagine if we didn't have that. Suppose we had nothing except Genesis to Malachi. We need the message that Paul carries. And we come down to the 21st verse, a verse that everybody knows, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I want to focus on that. In this video, I want to talk about, I want to talk about this. Now, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that, this, this verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that ranked up, you know, in the top 10 verses that's quoted today. And it's so easy to read that and, and to say what we see here is the mind, the dedication, the service, the commitment of a man named Paul and that he was living for Christ. And I don't think that's what the verse says. For to me to live is to live for Christ. Well, it doesn't say that. For me to continue living, it's, it's a present infinitive. For me to continue living is Christ and to die is gain. The word is gain or profit in the Greek. And so normally we, we now preach some tremendous sermon on human sacrifice, human dedication, human service, human commitment, as we see it exemplified in the, the Apostle Paul and Paul becomes our Example, I mean, as, as far as our conduct is concerned, or at least as far as we think Paul's conduct was governed. I mean, we, we just, we look at Paul, he was a success story, and we try to emulate Paul. I think that there's much more to that verse than urging you to commit your lives totally to Christ. Most of the articles that I've read over the years most of the sermons that I've heard on this particular verse would seem to indicate that the choice is yours as born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ headed for heaven because Jesus Christ died in your place. You have the option to live as Christ. doesn't say that. doesn't say that. Yet we usually hear this verse approached as though that there is an option involved and the difference in people is the measure of their commitment. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to develop a train of thought here 
through a number of, of verses that I believe are relevant. And so we'll start here with uh, this list of verses I've compiled. I want to go through them and I want to touch on them briefly. And I want you to see how that, to see if, if any of this makes sense to you. Habakkuk chapter 2. What we read in the Hebrew is a righteous man shall live by his faith. Now, actually, I'd like to translate the Hebrew a little better. The righteous man shall live by his faithfulness. The, the righteous man's faithfulness? No. God's faithfulness. God was very explicit in, in Habakkuk pointing out that this man who is living is already righteous. And in previous studies, I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you folks, that, that the core, the, the very center of much of the theological thinking today is centered in whether or not you think justification means to make righteous or to declare righteous because you are righteous. If you read, for example, that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, but Abraham was justified by faith. If, if you read that as saying that Abraham did, did, not, did not used to be justified but because he believed God, now all of a sudden he's now declared to be justified, made righteous, then you're probably, well, you're right there in agreement with the majority of, of Christian thinking today. But you are not in agreement with the Word of God. God does not make somebody righteous because they believe. God makes you righteous in Jesus Christ and then declares you to be righteous when you believe. The reason you believe, folks, is because you were made righteous. And when you believed, you were shown to be justified. You were shown to be righteous. That is, you were declared to be righteous. What people long to do is make it say that we live by our own faithfulness. You have the option, okay? You can live one way or the other. But I believe the Word of God is crystal clear in saying that the life that we live is based upon the faithfulness of God, not our faithfulness, but His. So let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 4. The Holy Spirit, like He always is, He's very explicit in this particular revelation of, of our Lord. And here He is, led into the wilderness, and He hasn't had anything to eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And the first temptation that we see is, if you are the Son of God, then command these stones to be made bread because you're hungry. And the answer is, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What kind of life is he speaking of there? What kind of life do we have in, in, Hab in Habakkuk? The righteous man by God's faithfulness. The same kind of life of which Paul is speaking of here in our present study. We don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And once again, it's easy to suggest an option. You know, you as Christians could live by bread alone, and, you know, it, but you have the option to live by words. You know, it's it's an option. You don't you don't you don't have to. And I scream at you, no. Absolutely not. You may not spend much time in this book, folks. You may not be diligent in your study and in your application of its truth. But believe me, you live by it. I, I didn't say you obeyed it, okay? I didn't say that you kept it. But I am saying that your very life is wrapped up in God, whether you know that or not. It's true in John chapter 5. Let's look at John chapter 5. You read John chapter 5, you see the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is, in, you see, in disputing with the Pharisees and the Jews. They couldn't understand the message that, that he was teaching. Bear in mind, these men are skilled in the Old, old Covenant. All right, they profess to be worshiping Yahweh, Jehovah. To understand that revelation and and to be diligent in their study, and yet in all of that study, they don't see that life. That life is Christ. 
uh, you search the scriptures daily because you think that in them that you have life, but you're unwilling to, to, to come to me that you may have life. The Father will provide the Lamb. So the Lord Jesus Christ is, is the, disputing with these Jews. He points out that as God ha has life in Himself, even so He's given the Son to have life in Himself, and the Son gives life to, to whosoever He wills. And now you say, but yeah, but Steve, that's, that's obviously a spiritual aspect of life. It has nothing to do with your breathing and eating and and so on and so forth. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's, it's inconceivable to me to separate your living and breathing and eating and sleeping and here from your spiritual life. Every moment of your physical life here is inseparably wrapped up in its spiritual counterpart. And it was given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives life to whomsoever he will. I'm suggesting that that the life the Holy Spirit speaks of in Philippians 1.21 is incomprehensible to the man who is not in Christ Jesus. What we see on the outside is the same breathing in air and, and eating food and but I go on in John chapter 6 where in disputing with the same Jews, the Lord said, Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall live. What a horrible cannibalistic thought. No wonder the Jews were absolutely shocked that Christ would say such a thing. It is shocking language. The vicarious suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we died with Him. We were buried with Him. We were raised with Him. That's what He meant when He said, Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Dearly beloved, eating His flesh and drinking His blood. It was necessary that we do that to live. And that is what you and I did. John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No wonder for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's the same life in the most loving of language, our Lord said, because I live, ye too will live. That's why for, for me to live, to live is Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ did not say, because I live, you too have the opportunity to live. He didn't say that. Now, now that's what I, I seem to hear today. But Christ didn't say that. The Holy Spirit doesn't say that what He doesn't say here is what God did in Christ has provided the opportunity and the rest is up to us. Christ did not say that to a group of of a well, it, you know, at least from the human standpoint, very poorly equipped people, all of whom were to shortly die as martyrs. He says, "Because I live, you live. Not not because I live, you have the opportunity if you so choose to live. He, that's not what he said. But because I live, you live. You have the opportunity if you so choose to live." That's, that's not what he said. Romans 5.10 clearly says, Since we have been justified by his death, we shall be saved that is delivered by his life. His life. Come to grips with the fact, folks, the reality that our lives are inseparably entwined with the life of Christ. Our very life is, is Christ. We're not looking at the greatness of Paul, but some truth that belongs to you and to me. And it's the Holy Spirit who says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Romans 6, 
We see how we are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. In the 14th chapter of Romans, we live unto the Lord, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Okay? This is, this is what I'm seeing in our present study following our, our still being here after May 17. This is what the Lord would have us. If you've been following us through this study in Philippians, uh, this is what we're looking at. Come to grips with the fact it is a true fact that our lives we have been identified with Christ in his death burial and resurrection our very life is Christ we're not we're not looking at at the greatness of Paul we're certainly not looking at the greatness of ourselves you know the some strength that's within you And to die is gain. Yet, you know, most of my friends read that to say, whether we live, we, we could be the Lord's, or whether we die, we could be the Lord's. You know, whether we live or die, we got the opportunity, if we so choose, to be the Lord's. That's, that's kind of that's what I've, I've been accustomed to listening to for the past 30 years. That is not what that's saying. No, that's not what that's saying. And that forces us to come to grips with the, the fact that the mess that we're living is the life of the Lord. Can that really grip your heart, folks? Can it? Listen to me. Dearly beloved, listen. Please listen. You know that your life is not a, the, a portrait of perfection. You know that. Can you believe that the mess that you're living is the life of the Lord? Can that... Can that can that sink into your thinking in such a way that it has an impact, the, the impact that it should? That whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. And the language is so definite that one would have to violate common sense to suggest that what the Holy Spirit is saying here is you have the opportunity to do that. What the Holy Spirit is saying, folks, that it, it is what it is. Therefore, that should condition how we live. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? Why? I mean, why should I do that? My, my life belongs to God. I'm going to go to heaven. So why should I present my body as a living sacrifice? And the answer has to come thundering back. There's only one answer. It's not law. Folks, it's law. If you don't love him that much, don't do it. If you're going to do it out of fear, wasted exercise. Do it out of law, wasted exercise. If you don't love him that much, by all means, don't do it. Perfect love casts out fear. There's only one reason to present ourselves as a living sacrifice of worship unto God. Because we live... Period. We're, because we're alive. You're presenting yourself to God as who you are. Alive. Because you live. Because He lives, we live. For me to live is Christ. Galatians chapter 2. I was thinking maybe we might go from Philippians to Galatians if we're still here. That's, that's another powerful epistle. In the second chapter of Galatians, Paul says that we are dead to the law in order that we might live unto God. And the prevalent attitude today among many Bible students, among many Christians, is that we got to make ourselves dead to the law. It's not what it says. You know, and the people that are telling you that, you know, they, they seem to conveniently leave out the part that in order to do that, we haven't, in order to, to be, oh, we've got to, we got to make ourselves dead to the law. We've got to die a lot. In order to do that, folks, we have, in fact, placed ourselves back under the law, okay? I, 
you're not going to you're not going to to get out from under the law to get under grace by living under the law the laws uh I, there's so much i want to say about this the law folks first of all it was never given to the church in the first place There are rigors of the Christian life, okay? And what Paul says is, if I haven't died to the law, I cannot live unto God. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, this is the, it, even the avoidance of legalism, okay, can become to us who are living under grace a law. Let me. And there's a lot of confusion as to as to the meaning of law. What is law? I mean, what is are we talking about the the law, the Ten Commandments, the you know all of them, all the precepts of the law, or just the ten, or or are you looking at the New Testament as a whole different set of laws? Well, it's the law of Christ. Okay, so Christ, we're under grace, but really Christ is giving us a long list of of laws. To you know, what is law? I'm going to tell you what law is, folks. Law is any given standard whereby we think that we might obtain or maintain righteousness on a human level. All righteousness is of the Lord. All righteousness is of the Lord. We don't have any righteousness. Except what was imputed unto us and except what flows through our lives through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. That's the thing that you need to see in the second chapter of Galatians, that until I died to the law, I couldn't live unto God. But guess what? I did. I died to the law. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord. So we live unto the Lord. Not I have to live unto the law to live out some life unto grace that Paul is talking about. To do that, I have to think of all the precepts of the law. So where's my mind at? Well, constantly, all day long, every single minute of the day, my mind is on what? It's on law, okay? It's not on Christ. The fulfillment of the law. We have the fulfillment of the law living in us who lives his life in and through us by faith. That's, that's the formula, okay? Not some new set of instructions by Christ that, that sort of supersedes, you know, Moses's. uh you know, the Ten Commandments are all the precepts of the law, the Old Testament law. Yeah, the covenants changed. We've gone from old to new. You know, we've gone to law from law to grace. But we're still really under law because all of this stuff that we're seeing is just stuff to do, to perform, you know, to, to where that we might, we think we might obtain or maintain righteousness on a human level. That's, that's law, folks. And we are not under law. We have died to the law death okay is a very serious matter if 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 your bible is telling you and my bible is telling me that we have died to the law we have died to it folks you better take that serious okay death's a serious matter until i died to the law i could not live unto god Unless you've died to law and legalism, you cannot live unto God. And yet the Holy Spirit says you are. And He gave us the earnest of the Spirit, the down payment of the Spirit. And, you know, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing to realize that in the mess in which I live, God has given me His Holy Spirit, who tells me that I am crucified with Christ. We know that we know that from Romans chapter 6. I died with him, I was buried with him, and I rose with him. Paul didn't rise from the dead on the D Damascus road, okay? He rose from the dead when Christ rose. You rose from the dead when Christ rose. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives within me. And we say, well, that's, that's sweet poetry. Steve, oh, that's, that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. Not I, but Christ. And then we go about 
every, our lives as if everything's all about the I, okay? But, but hold on a minute. Not I, but Christ lives within me. And the life which I now, now live in the flesh, I live by what? My own faithfulness? My own, you know? No, I live by God's faithfulness. Just what we read in Habakkuk chapter 2. Who loved me and gave himself for me. For me to live is Christ. Did you know that never in the New Testament did God ever mention anybody's sin un under the law? Okay? We see David committing premeditated murder and adultery. But under grace, God doesn't see sin. Where's your focus at? Is it on your sin or is it on your Savior? It's a question that every Christian ought to ask. Where are you at? Where are you at in your Christian experience? Are you able to say, as the Holy Spirit has in Romans 7, and we, we can turn there. That's, that's, that's a good... Most of you, we, you remember... We, <clears throat> I, I, could almost, I wish I knew it by memory. For the good that I would, I do not. I do that very thing that I don't, that I, I don't do the very thing that I, I expect that I should do. But what I do do is I do the very thing I don't want to do. I mean, that's, that's the dilemma that I'm in. That's, that's the conflict that Paul describes. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, well, that I do. You know, oh, wretched man, I am. How wretched are you? We live by Christ's faithfulness, folks. The problem with modern Christianity is that they're trying to live by their faithfulness, and it won't work. It's only by grace that you could say, it's not I, but sin that dwells in me. Okay? It's only by God's grace that you could ever come to say that. Colossians chapter 3, for those of you who followed us through that epistle, amazing epistle. Since you've been raised with Christ, not if maybe you were, not, you know, maybe you were, you know, maybe you weren't, but, but since you've been raised with Christ, when Christ was raised, set your affection on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's, that's this this life of Philippians 121. You were dead, but you have a life that is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3. Now when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Philippians is not saying, not saying, for me to live is to live for the Lord Jesus Christ in service and commitment. It is saying for to me to live is Christ. And someone says to me, well, Steve, most Christians seem to want to be closer to God. And I, I you know, you don't seem to be, you know, wanting to be closer to God. You, you, you know, all your videos, I've watched you for so long and you never, you're never doing, telling us to do anything to be closer to God. And my answer to that, folks, <laughs> is most Christians. Look, the person asking me that, I, I don't think that they, they realize that their lives are hid with Christ and God. How could I be any closer than that? That my life is hid with Christ and God. You want me to be closer to... You're, you're telling me what... You're giving me some formula some list of instructions, some, some, I don't know, you know, just make it up, make up your own list of ideas, you know, your uh, formula, ABCs, you know, that I have to go through to, to somehow become closer connected with to be Christ, to become more in fellowship with Christ. You, you've got some idea, some scheme as to how that I can become closer to Christ. I'm telling you that I can't become any more closer than what I already are or what I already am, and that is hid with Christ in God. How could I be possibly be, folks, any closer than that? And I don't ever hear 
from them again uh, when I tell them that. I, my life is hid with Christ and God. And when he who is my life shall appear, then shall I also appear with him in glory. That's gain. That's exactly what our text says. For, for to me to live is Christ. That's the only life I have. And what I see the Christian community as a whole today uh, looking at is the life of the flesh. First John, whosoever is born of God. That's, that's whosoever means whosoever. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Whoa, wait, stop. What, what, do you, what's, what is he saying? Doesn't commit. Oh, I know because I know I do. Does not commit sin for his seed abides in him and, and he has no ability to sin. That's a verse that goes contrary to the to the to the main narrative of modern Christianity today. That can't possibly mean what it says. So what, what it really means is when when we are doing everything right, we have we have no ability to sin. That's not what it said. Almighty God declares, is declaring that whatsoever, whosoever, whosoever is born of God does not sin. Doesn't sin. You cannot read that verse without and come away with anything other than an understanding of the fact that you have two natures, an old man and a new man that can... Neither one can do anything other than what they are inclined to do. The, the new man cannot sin. The old man, that's all it does. That's all it does. And guess what? For the most part, for the most part, most Christians today, in general, they're focused on cleaning up the old man. On, they're focused on what the flesh can do, what the old man can do. Many of them are, are not even aware of the fact that they have a sinless new, that they've been made a sinless new creation in Christ. That they have a new man which cannot sin because they've been born of God. Christ has come and united himself together with you in that inner man, that new man, that created new man, the sinless new man, because he can't be touched by sin. He has nothing to do with it. There is no connection between Christ in you and the flesh, your flesh, the old man. He's not in any way connected with your old man. He can't be. It's the new man. And the new man is sinless. You live by his faithfulness. Okay, You were raised with Christ to walk in newness of life, his life. Your life is hid with Christ in God. As far as the outworking, the general outworking, the general, your day-to-day -day conduct, if that's the discussion that's on the table, for, if that's what you want to talk about, is your general day-to-day -day activity, your general day-to-day -day life, your general day-to-day -day walk, your general day-to-day -day conduct. In, in living out what, what God has put in you, okay? If we don't put Christ before, I've said this I don't know how many times, we, put, we tend to put the, the cart before the horse. Okay? It's not that, well, if we do, God will do. It is we do because God has done. That's Christ our life. Has no ability to sin. The new man has no ability. That's a verse that, go, that flies in the face of Christianity's main narrative, okay? That we got to clean up the old man. Almighty God declares that whosoever is born of God does not sin, okay? The very first command given you in Romans 6.11 is to reckon yourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. First command, if you want to talk about commandments, if you want to talk about law, if you want to talk about doing the will of God, if you want to talk about being, being honest, okay, in answering back God, in, in, in giving back God what, 
what he expects and desires from you, which is your life is a living sacrifice. You've got to understand that you're alive. I know very few Christians today that they're really walking around believing, knowing, believing that they have been made alive in Christ, that their life is hid with Christ in God, that they're, that they're living by his faithfulness, not their own, because our own can fail. His will not. You know, and some Christian says, that can't be true of me. You know, it might be true of you, Steve, but it ain't true of me. You know, I, I look at my life, that's, but it is true. It is true. And contained within that, that gem of truth is peace, joy, rest. It's, it's, it's the good news of grace that we preach. It's our joy and our crown. It's the mission of blessed hope forever. For to me, to live is Christ. Steve, what an easy excuse for sin. I, I, I can hear it now. You know? You're just excusing away sin. Now, you know, you can, you're saying, I can, I can now do, just do anything I want to do. I don't, you know. Galatians 5 clearly says you cannot. Okay? The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Does that sound like that you can just do, live however you want? They're contrary one to the other so that you can't do the things that you would. The flesh can't do the things that it would. The spirit can't do the things that it would. You are involved in a horrible, horrible, horrible conflict, folks. But Romans 7. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. But there's no law. For peace. There is no law, folks, for peace. There's no law for joy. There's no law for rest. Okay? The conflict between the old man and the new man. Okay? It is, is a violent conflict. And my heart aches for every one of you. We get down to verse 27. I only let your... Your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That, that, that what, folks, what is our conversation? Is it the good news of Jesus Christ? That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, of ruin, spiritual ruin, but to you of salvation and that of God. Verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but to suffer. It's... it's for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Same conflict. Folks, I wish I could spend more time on this, but this is... It's, it, because it, it goes right to the heart. When we talk about not I, but Christ, and our life being Christ, and Christ in us, and Christ in us, the hope of glory, Christ manifest. Uh, the faithfulness of Christ, you know, when, when we when we talk about Christ, when we put Christ at the forefront of the conversation, there's a whole lot to say about it, about this subject, and and how that 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 whole idea of Christ, our life, relates to us in a very specific, very particular way as we walk through our our day-to-day -day life and we set our affection we're going to we're going to set our affection one, one on one thing or another folks one thing or another 
Where have we set our affection? Have we set it on ourselves? Have we set it on something other than ourselves? Or have we set it on Christ? Where is our affection? Because where our treasure is, our heart is, that's where our treasure will be. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to continue on because it's God's will, God's purpose that we that we do that. That's that's it's His perfect provision for us. We've seen that in the very study that's that's taking place here in Philippians. I love you and I thank you for all that you've done for me, this ministry, all your messages, your your wonderful kind messages of encouragement. Uh, I thank you so much for that. I thank you for all of all of your support. I ask for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry, and I want you to know that I pray for you all constantly. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.